just exactly. We will record this meeting, so please click uh, confirm. Uh, I will hand over in a second to Neve Small um, for a short welcome. Afterwards, Elisa uh, will look at the European level and speak about civil society and the use digital policies. Um, then um, Dr. Anne-Marie McGoran will bring in the Irish perspective and share more about the digital transformation in the Irish context. And the second part of this um, event is about you. It's uh, co-creation sessions with a focus on five topics, digital democracy, democracy, economy, rights, safeguards, and education. And um, as you have seen, we are recording this event. Uh, the follow-up email will include all presentations we share here today, all the links, all the materials, and of course, also this recording. So, and that's it already. I hand over to Neve. Hi everyone um, and welcome to today's event. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting myself and um, as a representative of um, the Consultation Institute. Um, so the Consultation Institute, just for a bit of background, is a not-for-profit best practice institute um, promoting high quality public and stakeholder consultations um, across the public, private and uh, voluntary sectors. They also run a membership um, a fellowship where people can come and become members of the Consul Consultation Institute. Um, but more information can be found about that online. Um, my role today at this event uh, is responsible primarily for the final report um, based on the findings uh, of today's event, uh, which will be circulated to all participants in the follow-up email. So if anyone has any questions or queries about that, um, you can contact me at um, my email, which I'm sure can be circulated as well. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to today's event. And thank you very much again. Great. Thank you so much, Neve. Uh, and this is already the time to hand over to Lee Elisa will share um, uh, more about civil society and the use digital policies. And I would stop sharing my screen now. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. I have a small presentation, so Good. I'll share my screen. So hi everyone, um, I, I'm very excited to be here today and I'm very happy to have this collaboration with The Wheel and uh, the Consultation Institute. So my name is Elisa and I work as the Program Director on European Democracy for the European Citizen Action Service and together with my colleague Vasiliki we will be hosting the co-creation session um, later on and this uh, co-creation session is really about how we can have a digital transformation in Europe that leaves no one behind. And it is an event that is co-funded by uh, the European Union. It is one of our activities, our projects. As an NGO based in Brussels, our um, mission is to empower citizens to exercise their rights in the EU. And of course, one of the most important rights is the, the right to participate in policymaking processes. Um, so I would like to just give you a brief overview on why we are hosting this event, what is the, the point of it, what is the objective and why you are here today. So basically ECAS uh, for the past um, year has been working quite hard with other NGOs in order to form a coalition called the Civil Society Convention uh, which has more than 90 organizations all over Europe. We created this coalition a year ago because of the Conference of the Future of Europe, and we wanted civil society organizations to have a voice in this Conference on the Future of Europe. For those of you who are not familiar with the Conference on the Future of Europe, it, is, um, it was an initiative of uh, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, when she started her, her mandate, she promised to European citizens that they would have um, a participatory democracy mechanism where they could actually participate into voice 
what they wanted the EU to do in the future around certain policies. And this has been happening over the last year. We're actually at the, the final stage where on the 9th of May, Europe's Day, the, uh, the institutions will come back to citizens to tell them how their ideas will be implemented in the next few years. So, um, so civil society came together to actually support this uh, conference on the future of Europe. So what we did as ECAS was that since we're part of the steering committee of this convention, we had different tasks and different policy areas and ECAS was leading the digital transformation cluster. So through this process, we opened um, basically a crowdsourcing platform in order to collect civil society's recommendations on digital transformation in Europe. And we've been running this crowdsourcing platform since last year, July. And we just closed it uh, um, in January, and then we started our policy making. So, what did uh, um, this uh, crowdsourcing do? Um, this crowdsourcing platform was open, and there were five different topics in it: digital democracy, digital education, digital safeguards, digital uh, rights, and digital economy. And most probably, you've received also this information in advance before this event. I hope you had a time to flip through it because we're really just going to go through um, these recommendations. And the goal today is really to give you a perspective of what NGOs um, in Europe have been asking the European Union to do regarding digital. So these are the topics. And um, I just wanted to show you a bit of the timeline that we had through the convention. So as I said, it was in different phases on the crowdsourcing platform the ideas collection phase. So this means that from July to November last year, we opened up this crowdsourcing to receive NGOs specifically perspectives on these five topics I mentioned. In the second um, activity from December to January, we closed the first phase and we took um, these ideas and put it in the second phase where NGOs had to vote for which ideas they thought were the most important to bring to the European level in the Conference of the Future of Europe. And then there was the policy formulation phase. So we took the main ideas selected in the second phase and transformed it into a resolution. And then in the fourth uh, step, as you can see in March, we had the final resolution, which was adopted then from um, the different NGOs in the, in the convention. So the working group uh, that did the policy formulation was composed of 15 to 20 NGOs um, that worked together. So on the platform, we generated more than 200 ideas and recommendations and the working group members by themselves since their umbrella organizations represent approximately 1,200 CSOs all across Europe. As you can see, these are the list of some of the uh, working group members that I had the privilege to really work together with and come up with these recommendations. Um, as you can see, maybe you are a bit surprised to see that these NGOs are not specifically dealing only with digital issues, but they're really um, dealing with inclusion and accessibility and, and how to make European integration stronger um, and dealing with European democracy. So, um, the whole point was for NGOs to come up with the values that they would like to see in digital policies. And uh, we look forward really to working together um, to know Irish citizens' perspective on these recommendations and also to have a co-creation session to know how you think uh, um, you know, we should actually move towards more digital inclusion. Now we have a very quick um, icebreaker. So I would like to, for you to all connect on Slido. So the easiest way to do so is basically if you can use your phone and just use the QR code, you can access immediately to this little poll. Um, if not, you can just go to slido.com. You put the hashtag 736065 uh, and then you put the pass code, which is inclusion without a space in the end, just inclusion. And uh, you will access to this little icebreaker that we have. This is also to test out uh, if the platform for the co-creation session works, because we will be using Slido so you can keep this open um, on your browser or on your phone.
So I'll just give you just a few more seconds. And already you can see the results from the participants. It's a live um, function. And it's good to see that uh, we have quite the, sometimes the opposite. So some have a lot of um, background on digital transformation in the EU and uh, some have some basic, most of you have some basic knowledge and there's also 31% who um, is going to learn a lot, I guess, today, and which is great as well. Just so you know, this whole co-creation session doesn't at all um, mean that you need to be a technical expert on digital policies, not at all. It's, uh, you will see that the co-creation session has quite easy questions. You can make it as technical as you want it to be. And uh, we just really want the insight from local partners of NGOs. So the point is for us as a European organization to come to the local NGOs and to understand how much do they know about this topic and what would they like the EU to work more. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, I will stop sharing now and I'll hand it again over to Christina and I look forward to co-creating <laughs> later with all of you, thanks. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, great, thanks for giving this overview and also putting it in context where we are in because like this event is actually part of this European process that Elisa just um, told us. I just saw in this in the chat that some of you are trying to put the password and it's not wo uh, working. So I had it before also, so maybe it's the same. Uh, you go to Slido, you first put this hashtag and then it asks for the passcode. So, and also of course, Vasiliki also shared it right now, try to um, do it with a no space at the end. So it's really um, need to be the exact one. Let us know if it works out. Otherwise we will try to, to help you on that. Um, thanks everyone for contributing already. And now um, coming from an EU uh, level perspective to the Irish context, I would like to hand over to Dr. Anne-Marie McGoran. She's our speaker for today and she will share more about the Irish context of this topic. Hey, great. Thanks a million, Christina. And thank you to yourself and your colleagues for asking me to speak today. So I'm going to try sharing screen now. So hopefully that will work. It was great earlier. <laughs> so how does that look? Uh, yes, we see. Yes, that looks That's perfect. Great. OK, so um, I work for an organization called NESC, the National Economic and Social Council. So just to give you some background on that, it was set up in the 1970s to advise the Taoiseach on government on strategic policy issues relating to economic, social and environmental development in Ireland. So it's made up of two parts. There's a council, kind of like a board, which is made up of social partners from employers, trade unions, farming pillar, environmental groups, community and volunteer groups. There's also the heads of a number of government departments and independent nominees. And then the other part is a secretariat of researchers and I'm a woman. So we draft reports that are requested by the council and they approve them at their meetings that are held four times a year. And they're chaired by the top civil servant in the department of Antishuk. So last year and the year before, as COVID was having a huge impact, we did a number of reports in NESC looking at the social impact of COVID. So looking at digital inclusion was part of that. And you will see our report on that on NESC.ie. And I will just talk today about some of the relevant things that came up in that research. So in my talk, I'm going to cover um, three of the topics that you're looking at today digital education and democracy, and some on digital economy. So I look at what digital inclusion means um, and who is impacted by digital exclusion. And then I'll look at Irish policies and programmes that promote digital inclusion and some innovative international approaches. And then finally, just have some quick reflections on roles that civil society play and can continue to play and develop. So what is digital inclusion? It really means that everybody can contribute to and benefit from the digital economy and society. So that means having convenient, reliable access to affordable and accessible digital devices and an internet connection, and also the ability to use these confidently in your day-to-day -day life. So if we think about these different gateways to the digital world, 
First, obviously, there is the broadband connection, um, and that varies by areas, usually very good in Ireland in urban areas, but maybe not so good in a number of rural areas, particularly north and west, for example. Then you need a good device. I think before COVID, we were thinking, oh, will everybody be moving to do things on phones? But then we started to realize during COVID that actually you need a laptop to work. Um, to be well connected to the digital world, you need good software, good devices, printers, a range of material there. In terms of skills, you need two kinds of skills to engage with the digital world, the technical skills of going online. And they're kind of tricky because unlike reading, once you've learned it, you still have to keep learning all the new technology and the new ways of going online, the new apps, um, a lot of new skills that constantly need to be updated. And that makes it difficult for people who are just grappling with the digital world for the first time. And secondly, you need good content literacy skills. So to be able to read things and say, is this a scam? Is it misinformation? If I click in this link, you know, where is it going to bring me? Um, so a range of important skills that you need there. And of course, you need the confidence to engage online, because quite a lot of people who are not well engaged online say that they, they don't need it, it's not necessary for them, but they can tell you all the disadvantages of not being online, like not being able to book flights, missing out on digital or online uh, discounts. So support to get, help people to be confident to go online is very important as well. So who are the groups who are most impacted by digital exclusion? Well, obviously those in rural areas, they um, tend to have poor broadband connections. And also in rural areas, you have more older people who are less likely to be proficient um, in going online. Those with less formal education have poorer digital skills and those on lower incomes tend to be less connected to the internet or have poorer quality connections. They own less devices and they have lower skills. And all of these things kind of interconnect. Um, migrants, there can be pluses and minuses for the digital world for them. They're able to stay in touch with home, but it can be difficult to use public and private services online when you don't have good language skills in your new country. In terms of businesses, we know that very small businesses and those with older owners and managers tend to not be so proficient online and to have less um, online um, facilities and use less um, digital technologies. So we have seen since 2020, there are changes. More people on low incomes, for example, have got broadband and um, people's skills have improved, but there still is a strong social gradient there. And we can't assume that these will be caught up, you know, uh, there will always be groups falling behind and we do need to target supports at these particular groups. Because if you don't have good digital skills, it impacts the employment and training you can access, how you can access public services and private services such as banking. It's more difficult to communicate. You lose out on online savings. And um, if you have poor skills, you may inadvertently, um, you know, click the wrong links online. And it has big impacts for independence, so like so many services that can only be used online, and older people who need to get somebody else to help them access these services. So Ireland has had a lot of programs focused on getting more people online going back to the late 90s. So we've had a number of programs to roll out broadband connections. The latest is the National Broadband Plan. It will bring good quality fixed broadband to 99% of homes over a seven year period. And as part of this, uh, the government is also funding 300 broadband connection points or BCPs. And these are in communities where um, broadband is going to be rolled out later in the whole national broadband program. So these are kind of um, community uh, services where you can go and access the internet. Um, there's a free broadband connection and there can be devices. And during COVID, government and others suddenly realized that these little centers could become much more than just a place to get free broadband and are developing these so that they can be a bit more towards digital hubs and communities. We also have the EU's electronic communications code. It makes accessible, affordable broadband at home a right, and Ireland is transposing that into legislation. And then we have some free public broadband through the Wi-Fi for EU program. In terms of helping people with the cost of devices and connections, we have services available, computers available in public libraries. We also had some digital poverty grants during COVID from some local authorities. They help people to get online or to get uh, cheaper devices. 
we had the laptop loan scheme during COVID for third level students that was funded by government. And then we've had a number of programs where, for example, Facebook and Microsoft have connected with local authorities or libraries to provide devices and connections at a low price. We also have had a lot of skills programs going back uh, over 10 years to the digital skills program, which was free 10 hours of training um, in different locations around the country that anybody could access. And we had a range of skills training through ETBs and unemployment training courses. And last year, the government published its new adult literacy, numeracy and digital literacy strategy, which really kind of moves forward from the existing programs. And um, it's going to provide more Sorry, it's going to provide more funding for um, digital literacy training, uh, support more communities, bring together the existing uh, skills programs and kind of provide a kind of a roadmap for people in a one stop shop. They can go there and say, this is the level of skill I have. And then people in the one stop shop can say, well, this is where you can get training at the next level. Um, so just to kind of really have a better infrastructure for digital skills training. Um, in terms of government services online, we have commitments in the e-government strategy and the civil service renewal strategy to move as many services as possible online, uh, public services. But there is also a commitment to have assisted digital supports and offline services for those who are not proficient or not able to use online services. We have the EU's Web Accessibility Directive to make websites accessible to those with a disability and the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design in Ireland's National Disability Authority provides good um, guidelines on how to make your IT accessible. So just to look at what some other countries have done, there's some very innovative programmes uh, internationally to get more people online. Uh, the French have this Ardoise tablet. Um, they're, it's owned by a company linked to the French post office, and it's a tablet specially designed for older people. It comes preloaded with um, a number of apps that they would use. An older person can buy it for, I think it's 200 euros, and then pay, um, I think about 15 euros per month for an internet connection and a helpline and remote access by a family member or a friend to help them out if they get stuck. Um, if you buy it, it's delivered by your local postman who comes in and runs through how you can work uh, this tablet. So a kind of really interesting program that brings together community, business, trusted people to help this group to get online. The UK and Australia have the Good Things Foundation. It's a big charity that connects funding and community organizations to train people in digital skills, to now provide devices, and just kind of a really good infrastructure there to bring a few different things together and get more people online. They have worked with Lloyds Bank, which has a digital champions program. So staff members volunteer to train people in online skills and to help people do online banking. And Singapore has a range of really interesting programs. For example, it has a Seniors Go Digital program. You can drop into a local uh, digital hub and get support as an older person. You can ask questions, you can do training, you can get guidelines on how to do your shopping online, how to do online banking. And they have programs for young people to get free laptops while you're in school, or if you've left school, for example, you can get a loan to buy a laptop, or if you don't have a job, you can do hours of community service to pay for your laptop. So some really innovative things there as well. Um, in terms of public services being online, the UK Civil Service has done a handy guide for public sector organisations um, outlining the nine different stages of digital skills that most people have and saying, you know, this is how you should design your service for most people to be able to use. Um, and they also have guidelines on assisted digital support. Denmark has a digital post box for public services. So it's like my gov ID here, but people must use it, but they have exemptions for people with a disability, people without computers or with poor broadband locally, or people who don't have a good grasp of Danish language. So they can all apply to get, um, you know, correspondence from the state by ordinary post. Um, and then I think Portugal has gone beyond that again. It has 700 uh, what are called citizen spots. So I think it would be a bit like the Citizens Information Board here, except you can get help 
um, accessing public services digitally. So they have this kind of double screen system. You can go in and you can watch um, somebody on the screen filling in your details and you can fill some of them in and kind of click OK and kind of get guidance there. They have mobile citizen spots that go around the country to very remote areas and they even have ones that go to nursing homes to help older people uh, access services online. So some really interesting outreach there. So just to have a quick think about things that civil society can do and are already doing and can develop more to help with digital inclusion. I think some groups can play a great role making this visible to policymakers who don't see it very well. I think some middle class policymakers don't realize that there are groups who really struggle um, with various aspects of getting online, getting the right skills, having the devices, having the money for good broadband connections. Um, you could advocate, I think, particularly for older people who are often a bit invisible, for those with literacy and language difficulties as well, because they just end up having to read through a sea of stuff online, which is very hard for people with dyslexia, for example. Um, I think there's a role to lobby the EU. They fund digital inclusion for those of working age, but obviously there's a lot more, for example, older people who need that help. I think civil society is really good at partnering with other organizations in the community or a business or government, or perhaps with them all to really help uh, have multi solutions to get people online. I think civil society is a great role as being a connector from the community into other organizations like business and government and civil society organizations are a safe place that people can go to and say, you know, I don't have good digital skills, you know, they can admit that and they can be helped with that uh, or they don't even need to admit it because civil society groups are good at kind of saying oh we can help you do this so thank you very much for your time i'm really looking forward to the conversation today and i'll pass over i think now to elisa and Vasiliki. thank you yeah i'm thank just you. saying thanks yeah sorry Vasiliki. just saying thanks to uh to Anne marie great that was excellent input and now over to Vasiliki and elisa <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, well, welcome everyone in our co-creation session. As mentioned by my colleague Elisa, today we will focus on five topics. Uh, for each topic, Elisa will... Uh, um, sorry to interrupt, it's Margaret here. The other interpreter has just come online and we just want to do a swap over if that's okay. Christina, you are muted. Yep, absolutely. So thanks, Margaret. Thanks a lot. Thank and we welcome Darren. Thank you. Hi, Darren. We're happy to have you. Hi, guys. Thanks very much. Um, should I go on, Christina? Yes, absolutely. OK. So thank you everyone for joining us in this co-creation session. Uh, today with Elisa, we will take you through five topics. For each topic, Elisa will give you a presentation sharing a, a bit of details regarding the EU landscape, policy landscape, the main challenges, the main terminology, so that you uh, later on can contribute uh, through an interactive session uh, uh, where you will have the opportunity to respond to questions that will help us understand better your perspective on inclusion policies for digital transformation. Now, how uh, you log in into the Slido, uh, you either go through the QR and then put as the passcode inclusion with no space after it or you uh, go to slido.com you put uh, then the uh, event code hashtag 736065 and then you again put the passcode inclusion with no break after it um i think that uh, it's pretty straightforward and you will be able to see the Q&A in your screen. So during Elisa presenting, you will have the opportunity to share any questions. Maximum two questions uh, will be answered due to the tight schedule of the event. And I think having said that, Elisa, uh, let's begin with the topic of digital democracy and how we can make it truly inclusive. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Vasiliki. So I hope that everyone can um, 
can connect online so that uh, we can do the co-creation. Um, so as uh, Vasiliki was mentioning, for each and every uh, 15 minutes, we will change topic. And this topic is digital democracy. And I will always be giving a bit of the terminology around digital democracy, what it means. Uh, uh, and then I will move on to a few of the recommendations and proposed actions by uh, civil society organizations in the convention. So first of all, what is digital democracy? It's really the use of information and communication technology in uh, uh, political and governance processes. There are mainly three big uh, topics, concepts around digital democracy. The first one is e-government, and this is really focused on the government and it is the use of ICT to enhance public administration or public services. Just an example, when you, uh, for example, there are some countries in which you can declare your taxes online. This is uh, an example of e-government. The second big concept is e-transparency, and it's really the use of technologies to enhance the transparency of governments by allowing citizens to access online information. So every time you go on a governmental platform or portal and you manage to get information that you need, for example, even about uh, the members of, of the parliament or how a legislative procedure is going and you have access to this information, this is e-transparency. The third big concept is e-participation and it's really the interaction between the government and the citizens. And it's how the use of technology can allow citizens to participate in decision-making processes, to improve policy outputs, or in the best case scenario, even co-create policies together with their representatives. So co-creating a law together, for example. The fourth concept here is actually part of e-participation, but we specify it a bit on its side because it's e-voting and e-election. So to allow voters to uh, vote online, and this has been a, a big discussion also at the European Union level, where we talk about maybe a possibility of e-voting at the next European elections. So what has a civil society been calling for at the uh, convention for the European Union? So the main challenges around digital democracy, um, according to civil society, is ensuring accessibility, ensuring inclusiveness and ensuring transparency. And you will see that actually the result of our whole crowdsourcing process leads to the fact that these three challenges are horizontal throughout the five different topics. So we will see them constantly also under digital economy, uh, et cetera. So uh, just to go to some proposed action. So um, civil society organizations think that um, free, equal, and affordable internet should become just a fundamental right for every EU citizen, and it should be mentioned um, in possibly the next treaties, for example. Uh, it should become um, a right for everyone to access the internet. And this was taken as an example because in Finland, for example, it is a fundamental right for Finnish citizens to, uh, to have equal, affordable, and high-speed internet. Taken as an example. The second action proposed is around public services that are fully accessible and how to reach this goal is funding and collaborating with civil societies can, that can support those who are excluded from the digital transition or expanding more initiatives to guide citizens in the digital transition. Then another thing that was mentioned was that e-government solutions should always be made free and open source. Um, with a um, software license. So this was something very practical. Um, as for e-participation, so the interaction between citizens and governments, uh, there should be more channels at the European Union level. For now, we have consultations from the European Commission, petitions to the European Parliament, but we just think that these channels are not enough. We have the European Citizens Initiative, for those of you who know it, um, but we think that there should be more testing, more pilots, and more new methods of engagement using technology. And one of them could be e-voting at the next European elections, uh, provided, of course, that it is technically secure, efficient, and can guarantee transparency in the process. So that being said, we will start now actually with already our co-creation session. 
And I would like you to all join in on Slido. If you have it already open, that's great because you will receive already the uh, first question answer under polls. And uh, so uh, how we're going to do this is simply that you will see on your screen all of the questions of this session. You'll see that there are eight of them, six of them are closed session um, questions and two of them are open. And we will just give you the time to fill in this, uh, this little um, survey. And especially for the two last questions that are open questions, just take your time to really think about the challenges. I will read through the different questions now and you can already start um, yeah, answering them. So the first question is, do you regularly use online e-government public services in Ireland? Yes, no, or sometimes? Vasiliki, will we be seeing the, um, the live results? Um, let me, let me see. Um, normally they should be displayed. I, um, yes, we have two votes already and uh, does anyone have any problem with voting? Just uh, drop me a direct message through Zoom. Okay, we already have four. Okay, perfect. Um, great. Okay, so I see that everyone is... Um... Yes, uh, do you want to, to go through the questions and then see all the results? Yes, sure. So I was just waiting to see if um, people are connecting and I see that everyone is slowly um, connecting. So that's fine. I will just please feel free to just click on the, um, the answers um, because so we will look into the whole results afterwards. So the first question, as I said, is just to say if you regularly use online e-government public services in Ireland. The second one is, do you prefer public administration services to be online or offline? Of course, most of you will prefer them to have them both as they can be complementary. But if you were to choose one, do you like doing your public administration you know, work? <laughs> online or offline. The third one is, do you find it easy to access online governmental information? For example, around public services, legislative procedures, policy making processes, info on finding information on your uh, MPs, etc. Do you find it easy to access online information this time of the European institution? So while the other questions were really about um, local and national services, um, this question is more about the EU. If you ever, if you ever actually go on the European Commission's website to check a legislative procedure or what's going on, or even on the European Parliament's um, portal to see what your MEP is doing, anything like that. Then the next question is, did you ever use an e-participation tool to voice your ideas or even engage in policy making? Both are fine. Um, for example, have you ever filled in a consultation um, in Ireland or did you ever go to a citizen assembly, um, which is online or a participatory budgeting exercise from your local mayor or anything that is like that? And uh, this one is more on the European Union level. Would you be comfortable in voting online at the next European elections? So we have now two open questions and it's very good to see that uh, people are already joining. Um, what do you think is the main challenge to accessing e-government services online? So just think about when you're trying to deal with e-government services, you're trying to fill on an administrative form or uh, um, reach out to someone in the, in the public sector. Um, is it easy for you? 
and what do you think is actually the main challenge to accessing it and please always put yourself in the context of uh, for vulnerable groups and even if it's not difficult for you if you think of someone from a vulnerable group And then the last question is, what should be improved in terms of accessibility and inclusiveness in the digital in digital democracy? So here it's um, we would really value your input. As we said, the whole goal of this um, co creation session is also to come up with guidelines on how we can make digital transformation more inclusive. Perfect. Elisa, um, we have uh, only four minutes to go, so maybe you would like to comment on some contributions or maybe uh, Dr. Anne-Marie would like to comment something? Yeah, sure. Anne-Marie, would you like to say a few words or? No, I'm fine. It's really interesting to see uh, what everybody's suggesting. Um, That's great. <laughs> really loads of information for me thank you everyone <laughs> yeah so we'll just give you a couple of minutes more just to take your time especially for the open questions Just to say that we already have 33 people that have voted. Maybe in this question, because it is open-ended, uh, we have only 21 contributions, but uh, in most questions, we have more uh, contributions. Okay, we have uh, two more minutes. So everyone uh, wrap this up. We have 35 contributions. Uh, once Elisa changes her slide, you will not be able to contribute anymore. So um, you have one minute and something, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And just for people, um, I just wanted to also mention that for people who are not managing, for example, to get on Slido, and if you want to send your contributions afterwards via email, this is also possible. Um, so please let us know um, if you feel like, you know, sending more suggestions afterwards and um, maybe Christina, would we be able to follow up with a Google form for for anyone? Okay, I will absolutely. create the Google form and you can send it out to them. Yes, absolutely, no problem. Great. So everyone will contribute if they want to. Okay, Elisa, what do you think? Should we move on? Yes, sure. So I hope everyone had the possibility to contribute. I think we've been receiving a lot of uh, inputs. And um, yes, feel free to also, if you have anything else on the chat, you can also mention it there. Yes, we have 36 contributions already. Okay, so thank you all for your contributions and we will make sure to go through them in a more detailed uh, uh, manner after the event. With the support of the Consultation Institute, we will publish a report summarizing today's contributions. Let's move on the inclusion aspects and challenges when it comes to the digital economy. Aliza, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Vasiliki. So now the second topic that we tackled as uh, NGOs uh, um, was digital economy. Um, so digital economy is really the development of our economy based on digital computing. And there are just so many aspects around digital economy. Um, and um, first of all, I would like to go through a few of the, the terminology. Um, so as you can see here, I won't go through every single thing because I don't want to make this too technical. But when we talk about digital economy, there are some things that we need to think about. For example, digital finance. So really the impact of new technologies on financial services. And this includes uh, e-banking services, for example. Um, and, and I was going to intervene there, Eliza. I just want to swap with Darren. Please. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Margaret. 
Thank you. No problem. Then we also have data economy, which is the creation of a single market for data in the EU where data can flow across the sectors uh, to benefit all. And uh, the point is to have this use of data that is fair and practical and clear and respected. Then we also talk about a lot of environmental concerns. If you're into cryptocurrencies, you might know about them. Um, so in digital economy, it is also important to support green digital solutions. Um, so mainly developing and investing more in green technologies to achieve, uh, of course, all of our climate neutrality targets and, and accelerate the, the green digital transition. Um, there were also discussions around wealth, welfare, social welfare in the digital age, and also, of course, uh, the creation of businesses, companies uh, with the use of technology. So um, some <laughs> examples that are mentioned here are Uber and Amazon, uh, but of course, there's just so many others. And of course, um, it is a, a big debate and issue. So as I said, uh, we are now moving to the proposed actions that we received and which were in the final resolution. As you can see, the main challenges uh, on your left are always the same, ensuring accessibility, inclusive, and also uh, one specific challenge is the creation of a, a single market for data in the EU. That was discussed a lot amongst our working group. Um, as proposed practical actions to the EU, NGOs call to support digitally and, ex and socially excluded groups. And um, so once again, the target, the target is all of those people who are left behind due to inaccessibility, unaffordability of technologies, unavailability, and also um, because of lack of connectivity or digital skills. So this is always number one in each of the subtopics. Then there were more practical uh, call for actions, for example, to introduce a corporate tax rules so that uh, profits are registered and tax based uh, on the, where the businesses are geographically located. Um, another call for action was to set up a central pool of advisors that can be requested by smaller companies to help them, to support them on what they can improve. And then a specific one on crypto assets. And um, yes, uh, and here maybe I would like to mention why this discussion also came out. If you know a bit about also when we've seen uh, the, the situation with Russia and Ukraine and how cryptocurrencies have been used. Uh, um, so examples in which authoritarian regimes try to circumvent global sanctions. NGOs are calling for more regulation also in cryptocurrency. So this is why this debate also came up. So once again, I would like you to uh, be on Slido. And um, now we have only, uh, if I'm not mistaken, just four questions because it is quite a, a topic and um, we did not want to overwhelm the, the participants in, on this topic. So first of all, do you think digital finance, so meaning um, you know, e-banking services, for example, the impact of new technologies on the financial services uh, are accessible to everyone? Yes, no, or I don't know. Um, go ahead, Elisa, and uh, take them through the whole survey because okay, uh, we will see at the end the results after they have submitted the whole okay. survey. Perfect. So please just fill it in and I'll just read the other questions. What could be done to improve the accessibility to these services? So again, an open-ended question and really think about practical services that you use also in your daily life around the e-finance. Do you see the use of technology to create new value in business models? Um, customer experience and the internal capabilities that support its core operations. So such as Uber, Amazon, um, as a good thing or a bad thing for our society. I do realize that, um, you know, the examples might, might lead you to think uh, mainly bad, <laughs> but uh, of course uh, there are so many companies that 
have been using technology and have been really, um, yeah, have grown a lot thanks to technology. And without that technology, they would have never existed. So, and then the last question, uh, no, the last question, yes. Are there any suggestions on how to make our digital economy more inclusive? So as you can see, we have left these questions quite open and you can feel free to take a, a few minutes again to just take your time and reflect on them. Basiliki, how many minutes do we have? Yeah. Yes, uh, so we have four minutes uh, and, uh, and we already have 16 contributors. Anne-Marie, if you want to chip in with a few comments, uh, please uh, feel free to, as an expert. <laughs> Thanks. I, I don't know if I'd be an expert in this area, but I do keep thinking, you know, that uh, companies have a huge role to play, those who are designing, um, you know, like new software, new computers, new everything. Like somebody told me about how they were teaching an older lady how to use uh, Microsoft. And she said, oh, so when you want it to stop, you press start. And I remember thinking, yeah, you know, there's all these things that we don't think about and that are have been there since the beginning of ICT and yet make it much more difficult for people who are arriving later to, um, you know, to take part and to get up to speed. You know, even things like all the little icons now when you go into um, to do things, they use icons instead of words explaining what things are. So there's just so many things I think could be looked at. Great yes, suggestions definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. If you have more anecdotes to <laughs> to share, but this is really it's really a problem, and sometimes it's just not visible enough how much of a of a challenge it is for 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 people and uh, in the working group we had we also had representatives of um, NGOs uh, that were trying to to protect seniors and um, and uh, yeah to to help also understand uh, how we can support uh, seniors in in using digital tools but I mean yeah. our conclusion as NGOs was simply that we always have to complement the online with the offline um, because <laughs> the reality is that we cannot also expect everyone to be online, either for their own choice or because there is a digital divide. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm just sorry to some... interrupt one minute just to inform the participants. Go ahead. Uh, I was just looking at somebody's suggestion on international iconography, and I think good idea because I remember trying to explain to my mum you know what the Google Play Store app looked like on her phone <laughs> over the phone because I have an iPhone and the app store logo is completely different so I wasn't yes. totally sure what it looked like so I think some standardization of things would help as well um you know as things move from being you know new and innovative to being used by everybody we probably have to think about some things like that um yeah definitely Definitely, I completely agree, so. Okay, thank you, Anne-Marie, thank you, Elisa. Our time is up and it is time to uh, move to the next topic, which we will be discussing uh, about uh, defending rights and freedoms in the online world that emerges. Elisa, could you please enlighten us on the main challenges that arise? Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, um, as you can see here, we had a subtopic which was called digital rights and defending freedoms online. And the reason is that, you know, we wanted to, to make sure to understand also what were the rights that citizens should have in the digital world. So when we talk about digital rights, we're thinking about secure and sustainable digital infrastructures and the right to everyone to access uh, these di digital infrastructures as uh, the main goal. Um, and when we were uh, mentioning digital rights, we had different topics that, that came up. As you can see, online privacy, 
uh, net neutrality. Um, for those who don't know what this is, it's the right to the internet access, um, to internet access, which should be offered to everyone on a non-discriminatory basis without favoring certain websites, applications, or services. Then we talked a lot here about data, data protection, GDPR, of course, uh, and the right to um, this protection all the time and the knowledge also about data retention. So what happens to your data when you actually put it on a website or you're doing e-shopping? How do they retain this data and use it afterwards for marketing purposes? Um, then we also had discussions, for example, around, around copyright uh, um, and uh, the way that it should uh, be implemented, um, which benefits the creators and the society. And this is because the EU has been working for many years on a copyright directive. Um, then we have also um, the safety of journalists on, online because, um, you know, the right to of freedom of expression and uh, how to protect journalists in this uh, environment uh, and in general protecting fundamental rights uh, online. Um, the main challenges here were always around the accessibility to this data, uh, digital infrastructures and also equality amongst people online. So what we have seen is that there are certain discriminations that happen online for example, people with disabilities are using certain platforms for them to access a certain website. And we've seen that um, these websites actually, um, you know, they, they keep the fact that the data around these uh, people with disabilities uh, um, and they, they mark them as people with disabilities. So there should be more neutrality on how this data uh, is uh, kept. Um, then there is also, um, yes, ensuring online privacy and data protection is a challenge, ensuring net neutrality. So there are some calls for action, which is a stronger e-privacy regulation, um, also reinforcing the D GDPR uh, nationally. Then protect highly sensitive information, such as migration status, uh, sexual orientation, race, or any information on vulnerable economic conditions. And uh, the proposal here is, for example, to restrict the access to this information as much as possible or limit the requirement of information for very exceptional cases or ensuring, for example, that public decisions are not based on big data and biased algorithms. Um, then around net neutrality, um, there are some specific technical issues around zero rating. Um, we don't have to go into that. Um, then, for example, um, encryption, it should be better protected and there is an, a chat, a control legislation as well around it. Then we have also building public digital infrastructure, such as public charging stations and Wi-Fi and ensure its financial sustainability. Um, one interesting one is number six on the ban mass surveillance and a facial and facial recognitions technology. Now, um, in the past few years, I don't know if you know this, but there has been a European citizens initiative. That means that citizens all across Europe have been um, have opened this uh, initiative, which is basically a petition to ban mass surveillance uh, um, and facial recognition technologies. Um, this has been a really, really great, uh, big debate among civil society organizations and, uh, and um, yes, and for now, there are some controversial issues because from the side of the institutions, for example, um, certain facial recognition technologies were introduced also to for counter terrorism um, plans, etc. So this is why there's a lot of debate around this. Um, then uh, there is also the reform of the copyright right directive, which is also quite technical, so it's not um, too important to go into detail. So we can start with the co-creation session here. I would like to you to join. Here we have also uh, just five questions. The first one is, do you think everyone in the EU should have the right, the fundamental right actually to free, affordable, high-speed internet and access to technological infrastructures. 
So here the case was, for example, in Finland. In Finland, it is a fundamental right. This means that all Finnish citizens have the right to free, affordable, high-speed internet. Do you think your rights are sufficiently protected online? So we were just wondering if every time you go online, you think that your rights as a citizen, as a European are sufficiently protected. Is it clear to you how your personal data is treated every time you connect online? This is interesting because we know that everyone is using constantly apps, chat functions, not only the big social media, but also different, uh, um, different apps nowadays are even under the same umbrella. So for example, WhatsApp is connected to your Facebook, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, and also when you go on a, a governmental service, do you know how they treat your data? So not only the big companies, but also others. What do you do if it is unclear to you how your data is uh, protected? It's nice to see that the first answer was proceed anyway, because I think that most, most people just proceed. I mean, I have to admit that I am one of them. Um, I try to refuse everything that they ask me. <laughs> permission to do but yeah sometimes there's just no choice and you just want to see it but it is good to see that some people are more conscious about the fact that it is unclear to how they store and how they use their data so don't open it close it and shut down the device is also a good answer not use certain services such as social medias like facebook it's also interesting how should we ensure that all citizens know what their rights are when they connect to the internet? Because some, um, of course the directive, like the GDPR is extremely complicated also for an, a European NGO such as ours. So it's interesting for us to see what do you think should be the way forward? How can we make sure that citizens or even younger people are, are for example, trained to know what their rights are when they connect to the internet. And here we mentioned really data rights, but also the right to the freedom of speech or um, you know, everything that, that goes around those topics. Okay, should we still one? Right. We do have more, uh, five more minutes. So yeah, yeah. maybe, um, I don't know, you'd like to, to discuss a bit about the responses, but I don't yeah, know. So or we can just give them time to, to respond, whatever you want, Elisa. Sure, I was already commenting. I was wondering if Anne-Marie found some of the <laughs> answers also interesting from her sp perspective. Yeah, I did. There's lots of um, there's lots of great suggestions on digital democracy and education. Um, and I find, you know, you've provided a lot of interesting information, for example, on safeguarding that I don't know much about. So this is great. Um, I look forward to seeing the, I think, the Google Doc of all everyone's suggestions. It'd be really good for me to go through. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, we already have 25 votes, so let's give one more minute for everyone to finalize their uh, responses and submit them, mm -hmm. and then we can move uh, to the next. Yeah, so I'm going back to the first question. I find it interesting that um, someone answered that uh, they don't think that all EU citizens should have uh, free, affordable, high-speed internet. And I would be very curious to know <laughs> why as well. It would be interesting to know if they yeah. can leave a comment uh, in the chat section. Of course, if they feel like it, of course. All of this, um, just so everyone knows, the, um, this is all anonymous. As you can see, there are no names on the screen. so. 
Do you think your rights are sufficiently protected online? Most people say no. Interesting to see here, no one said yes. Yeah. <laughs> is it clear to you how your personal data is treated every time you connect online? Most people, the majority says no as well. I do think that with the, of course, um, with the GDPR, at least on the European continent in Europe, this has helped a lot as well to protect our, our personal data. Yes, I think we can move on to the next uh, topic. Okay, uh, perfect. So thank you, everyone. Uh, the next topic is quite relevant since uh, it remains in the broader sphere of uh, digital rights. Let's move to discussing the possible digital threats and how we can protect all citizens from them. Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, it's uh, Darren here. I'm just going to swap with Margaret again. Perfect. Thanks, Darren. Um, so digital safeguards, is, um, there were many concepts around this one. It was a bit of a long one because we um, decided at ICAS to uh, have this subtopic because we do think that um, it is important to discuss what we think are the safeguards that decision makers at the EU level should put in place to ensure the respect of values, ethics and norms in the digital space. So while in the previous section, we talked about the rights uh, in digital safeguards, we, we want to make sure that there are EU policies and regulations also uh, in place to protect those rights. So the, certain, the different subtopics we mentioned were around cybersecurity. And this also uh, came a lot in, from the recommendations of citizens in the Conference of the Future of Europe. So, it was tackled a lot. Um, so it's really the protection from hackers, fraud, viruses, and the managing risk of hybrid attacks. The second big, big topic, which is also constantly talked about at the European level is artificial intelligence. So what NGOs are striving for is an AI that is ethical and that protects people's communities and society from um, escalating economic, political, and social issues proposed by, um, by AI. Then together with AI, of course, there's also the discussion more about algorithms. Um, sometimes these two are actually, for some people, the same concept. But I think the difference here when we talk about artificial intelligence is that artificial intelligence goes a bit beyond algorithms. Artificial intelligence is really a machine learning mechanism. And uh, at a certain point, it even goes beyond the human uh, process and starts learning on its own what is the best uh, ways forward. While algor algorithms, of course, is um, more about um, deciding what the algorithms are in the beginning from human view. And there is a bit of machine learning, but not as much as artificial intelligence, of course. And here, the importance around the transparency is of how these algorithms are implemented is very important. Then the fourth topic we tackled was around online disinformation protection. And again, I imagine that everyone is concerned about it in the digital era um, because we just constantly see so much false, inaccurate, misleading information online that is sometimes used to also cause public harm or make a profit. Um, Another uh, point we mentioned was around audiovisual media services, so how to regulate this online content and the role of online platforms in disseminating um, information and the direct imp impact it has on the freedom of expression and access to information. The sixth point was around the integrity of elections, so protection of integrity of elections and promotion of democratic participation online. Then the seventh was uh, around online hate speech. So prevention of practices uh, um, that really denigrates uh, people based on their race, ethnicity, gender, and social status. And this is also a very big topic and which goes together with the last one, which is illegal content online as well. So what are the safeguards to effectively tackle illegal content online? 
So as you can see, a lot of sensitive issues as well. Um, the usual challenges, uh, um, the, well, the challenges uh, go along with what I said before. So in ensuring cybersecurity, the ethical use of AI, the transparency of algorithms, um, the monitoring constantly of online disinformation and what to do about it, um, ensuring accessibility, of course, and also the monitoring of online hate speech, but also of illegal content. So around AI, we had a very big discussion around civil, with civil society organizations, and um, there have been some debates on uh, the fact that AI should always require a human intervention. Now, I have just one anecdote on this, which I think that you could find interesting. So when I was discussing this with one of the digital NGOs um, representatives, he told me, be careful of uh, saying that AI always needs a human review. Because for example, on a platform such as Facebook, um, illegal content, uh, terrorist content is automatically eliminated by an AI before there is any human review. And there has been research showing that if there were to be human actually doing the, the filtering of this type of content, it can lead to depression of people um, because they're exposed to such um, you know, negative content that it actually has a psychological effect on them. So we came up together with the working group and we figured that the best way is to develop a framework that determines the type, extent, and form and moments of human intervention in an AI automated decision making. And we think that the EU should create this sort of framework that could determine the criteria um, that uh, should be the impact of uh, the AI on rights, duties, and liberties. So it, we mean that it should be on a case to case basis uh, um, when this human intervention should be. So the second point is to regulate AI systems, including those that fall under the remit of the common foreign and security policy. And this one was also another interesting debate because um, there was one member of our group who also suggested that we should just ban all AI systems for weapons and military purposes. Um, and there, as we can imagine, the reality is just much more complex than, them, than that. So we should regulate it in some ways. Um, provide support, technical po policy, financial um, support for civil society organizations, of course, to, to help institutions to, to counter online hate speech, et cetera. Then the fourth one is to defend fundamental freedoms and deter illegal hate speech by including an online content moderation regime that requires a human review and form. Um, the fifth one is include more specific safeguards in the Digital Service Act, which is one of the um, acts of the European Commission. Um, and then uh, ensure that member states transport and implement effectively the audiovisual media services directives. And you can feel free to also check these out if you're more interested in EU policymaking. So we can start the co-creation session here. As I said, the questions are not so um, are definitely not so difficult. Um, so the first one is, according to you, how can we ensure that artificial intelligence and algorithms do not lead to discrimination? What can we do? Um, do you agree on the human review um, always, sometimes? So this is the first question. We'll give you a few minutes, uh, of course. Are there specific safeguards that policymakers should implement, especially to protect vulnerable groups. And then I'll go to the third one, because I think that one of the most important questions of this uh, co-creation session is this. What do you think are vulnerable groups in our digital society? When I say, when I say vulnerable groups, who do you immediately think of? And, or please list the vulnerable groups that you think we should be protecting. And what are their vulnerabilities? And in this case, please specify if you're talking about seniors, about children, about um, people with disabilities, people with migrant status. What do you think are the vulnerabilities of this specific target group?
So Vasiliki, can you tell us a, a few, um, how many minutes for this session? Um, yes, so because we have four uh, open questions, we can give them 10 minutes. I mean, this is a good time if someone wants also to have a short break to go drink uh, some water. We will be here. We will be monitoring live the, um, uh, the votes. We already have one vote. Um, uh, Elisa, maybe you want to, to see it, to take a look at the, the answers uh, the person gave. Yeah, just waiting to see if there are more. Yeah, yeah, I think it takes them a bit of time because they have to fill in the whole survey. Yeah, so, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I'll just leave it on this one. So, okay. And Marie, as usual, if you want to chip in with uh, your expertise, you can always feel free to. Digital safeguards is quite a complicated one. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking it's not, it's not an area focused on, but I was just thinking about, you know, the scale of what you would need to do here it really would need international agreements. You know, we know that some of those who are you know, sending misinformation or targeting the vulnerable are in other countries like in Africa and Russia and others. Like there's huge difficulties here in how you hold them to account and how you get agreement. Um, I think it's a very tricky area, but obviously regulation and good, you know, I don't want to say good punishment, but, uh, you know, effective punishments for those who who don't abide by these safeguards in the areas you can control, I think would be a good start. Um, you know, we're not we're not going to be able to solve all of this. I think some of it would just be better education, I think. Um, yeah, and I think also another thing to remember as well is there's a lot of benefits from algorithms, you know, like in terms of, um, Definitely. you know, even you know identifying you know medical diseases and things like that yeah. um but and human review decisions isn't always practical as someone has said um like it is impossible for humans to review mm -hmm. everything that's posted online um so i think this would be kind of difficult yeah uh, maybe I, guidelines for developers and involving more people in the design of algorithms um yeah yeah yeah, one thing that we really struggle, I think, in our conversations with civil society, I mean, which is a big challenge, is always to find the balance, right, of using the benefits, the potential of technology, but at the same time safeguarding citizens and vulnerable groups. So this was always um, difficult. And uh, another big um, debate that we had actually was around online content moderation. And it was more about uh, uh, the fact that there were two different points of view and one was really about, you know, you should just eliminate completely like um, false uh, news, uh, um, online disinformation. It should just never even appear on social media. And I think that uh, that was a bit yeah, I, I honestly don't agree personally with that point of view because I don't think that we want some sort of uh, policing around what should be online or not. So I'm more for the educational side. So really stimulating critical thinking of people, understanding that not everything that you see online is true to check your sources. And um, yeah, so there were some, also some citizens recommendations. The conference was really about, we should create some sort of authority, like an independent authority with different stakeholders in it 
that could actually constantly monitor and eliminate bad information. <laughs> but who would be part of this authority was my question. And you know, how would you actually do it? Um, so I'm more for the, we should have more digital education, which is actually our next topic and just really um, train people to understand that what they see online is not always the truth. I don't know if you have any uh, perspectives on that as well, Anne-Marie. Yeah, I think training, it does have a huge role to play. Um, and I know some countries are very good on it. I think Finland and Estonia are really, really good on it. Mm -hmm. um, they have it in schools and more broadly. So yeah, we could definitely do more on that. I suppose it's not so much about the A AI and algorithms that we're looking at now, but just more broadly for misinformation, scams, yeah, sure. you know, and I think also something about, you know, people are afraid to admit when they're scammed as well. We need to kind of talk a bit more about things people are afraid to talk about. Um, and I was also thinking of, I know Sinead Gibney, who was uh, logging on earlier, who's the head of chief commissioner in IREC, she and her thesis looked at pornography online. You know, how do you protect people from that? It's something that we don't even talk about, you know, but uh, there's a lot of bad stuff out there and just the education for young people and like what's real and what's not real would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, I think um, our time is almost up. So Eliza, if you want to um, comment on any of the responses, go ahead or we can go ahead to the next session if you want, as you see fit. Yeah, sure. I think that uh, these are all very interesting uh, perspectives and it is great to see uh, so many inputs and we'll definitely have, we'll do an analysis of them and come back to you with the final report, of course. But okay, yes, uh, um, let's keep it a bit more because now I see a lot of votes coming in. So okay. I am giving one more minute for everyone to submit their answers, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so just so everyone knows, when we were working with these NGOs, we really had all parts of civil society that were dealing with vulnerable groups. So we had representatives from, as I said, uh, uh, NGOs uh, working with seniors or also with people. We had the European Disability Forum as well, working together with us on the recommendations, but also FEANSA, which works with the homeless people. Uh, we also had other organizations working together with migrants. So the recommendations are really, uh, yeah, they were really co-created all together also with people specifically working. Also, of course, the European Youth Forum was there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. And let's move to the last uh, uh, session for today, a concept we experienced intensely during the pandemic, but it seems to be here to stay. Um, digital education policies and norms are already shaping and entail many challenges. Balancing between an innovative society and inclusive education is a tough equation to solve and Elisa, maybe you can take us through the main dilemmas of the field and the main terms. Okay. Um, yes, and thank you for everyone's uh, um, patience and resistance throughout these sections. So this is the last one and uh, it's about resetting education and training for the digital age. So we have five different, um, let's say terminologies here, um, digital competences and digital skills, which seem the same, but actually digital competences is around the basic set of skills covering information and data literacy, online communication and collaboration, and digital content creation and safety problem solving. When we talk about digital skills, uh, uh, we mention more specifically job related skills uh, or digital skills for ICT professionals. Of course, digital skills and competencies are um, in the same basket. Um, then we have digital learning, which is around the innovative use of digital tech tools and technologies during teaching and learning. 
We had media literacy, of course, uh, that goes hand in hand with, with what we were saying before about online disinformation. So the skills uh, that allow people to access, critically evaluate and create or shape the media. And the fifth one is awareness raising. So information, informing and communicating to citizens about digital practices. As you can see, uh, once again, the main challenge is accessibility to these digital education uh, courses. Uh, so um, ensure digital literacy for all citizens and data protection. So these are the three main challenges. So practical um, actions for the EU is to develop training and EU programs on a wide range of digital skills, um, ensuring that the, these are tailored also to citizens in a vulnerable position. So just the answer to that question on who are the vulnerable groups. In our working group, we mainly, we basically included people with disabilities, elderly people, net, um, refugees, low skilled adults, single women, low income household, people facing ex social exclusion. Um, as some of the vulnerable groups. And uh, we think that these trainings and EU programs should have more uh, financial resources. Then uh, uh, there, there should be also maybe more EU funding programs for civil society organizations to help develop these digital um, education strategies. Um, more consultations um, um, with educational you know, trainers when developing the, uh, the plans, both at the European and national levels. So to include, let's say, in digital education plans, more stakeholders that can help form these plans in a better way. And the fourth one is to teach, um, tra train teachers and public administrations better on how to use digital technologies, uh, um, the better understanding of algorithms um, and how to use softwares, et cetera. So a few questions once again on your opinions and ideas. Here we have uh, seven questions. Most of them are closed questions. So are digital education initiatives in Ireland easy to find and accessible for all vulnerable groups, for example, seniors, minorities, et cetera? Are you aware actually of any uh, classes or informal workshops given on digital education? Are there enough opportunities for individuals, citizens, and communities to attain a digital education after formal education? So meaning not at school when you learn about how to use a computer, but afterwards, especially for, for adults. Who could support in giving free digital education to citizens? Here we've listed just a few examples, but if you put other, you can also put it in the chat who you think should be giving free digital education to citizens. If you have any questions on a particular app, on a website or a platform, who would you ask for help? To a friend, to a family member, to a civil society organization, to a public institution, a private company or other, even to a neighbor. If you put other, you can even put on the chat a neighbor. I have a neighbor here who's constantly asking us for <laughs> IT support. Who do you think needs digital education the most? Who is currently left behind according to you? And then the last one, what are your suggestions? Um, especially for the guidelines we're going to create uh, for ensuring that every citizen has digital education and skills to navigate our digital society. Vasiliki, okay. maybe you can tell us how many minutes we have. Yes, of course. So we have uh, we have time. Uh, we are at the end of the session, and uh, until uh, uh, we have thirteen minutes, but I think we can we can close it like in ten because we only have two open questions. Yes, I see Christina nodding. <laughs> 
So yes, 10 minutes. Let's give it 10 minutes. We already have six votes. Uh, only four votes for the first open questions and only two for the second one. Um, hmm. Yeah. yeah well, they need a bit of time to think about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I see people have been giving resources in the chat. Anne Marie, you have been giving resources. Thank you. Okay, we already have 15 votes. 13 for the first open question and then 11, 12 now for the second. I think one uh, very interesting um, response on the open questions uh, is when people put I don't know, because it is true, these are so uh, complicated uh, terms and uh, we, we did dive into ethical dilemmas here. Uh, so this is also something you can put if you really don't know. I'm just wondering on all of this, if they had the same debates when people were all learning how to read, you know, like about 150 years ago or whatever, or it, did the same issues come up, you know, hard to find places to learn, hard for older people, people reading things that, you know, that were misleading or whatever. Um, pity we don't have any learning from it. <laughs> and yet now everyone, or mostly everyone, is able to read. So I think we have hopes here. Good point, good point. We can be positive in the longer term. <laughs> yeah, I guess for each time there is a challenge. So <laughs> each era of our history. I think the difference is that now the reading required you to have a pencil, a book, you know, uh, but now you need a device that is very expensive. And it is the only device that can help you get out of poverty sometimes. So it is quite uh, a complicated uh, obstacle. Yeah, and particularly all the constant updates and technology and skills that you need that really makes it quite different. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of um, challenges also during COVID in the past few years. During the pandemic, how difficult, uh, especially when, uh, well, in Italy, I'm from Italy, and there were a lot of debates about this uh, learning from a distance, learning from home. Teachers were just not equipped um, <laughs> to do this as well. And parents, because I was talking to teachers uh, and they would tell me that I would constantly get from most of the parents in Greece, uh, they would get uh, messages in the, their phone, like, how do I open the tablet that uh, they gave me? Mm -hmm. So I think 
every country experienced based on their level of uh, familiarity with the tools experienced different problems but still it was quite a challenge for most uh, even european countries yeah um i see we have uh, 24 votes uh, I will give two more minutes for everyone to 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 wrap it up and uh, submit their uh, their votes. We have a lot of open open uh, like responses in the open uh, questions. Uh, I think this has been quite uh, an interesting uh, co-creation session. Yeah, so we can close it soon. And then we'll hand back the floor to Cristina. One minute. Okay. Uh, okay, please submit all your answers. Um, yes, I think we're fine. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining our co-creation session. Elisa, thank you very much for the details. Um, Christina, um, you can take the floor. Thanks so much. Wow. Okay, Elisa Vasiliki, this was excellent. Thanks for this brilliant input information and for hosting it so professionally. Uh, I hope I speak for everyone here. That was uh, really like a, not only like an overview. I know that like putting this in this time frame, so much information, it's really a challenge. So you um, you really did this well. And I hope also for our participants, this was something to inspire, to think about, to broaden perspectives, and also to give actually oh, your own opinion. I'm sorry, it's my, oh. my, inter my computer went dead about three minutes ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't get the last two or three minutes. Should I, uh, should I repeat? Yes, please. I didn't get the end of the session either with the questions. What was, we got to the last one. And yes. Then Exactly. Maybe uh, uh, Vasiliki would like to wrap it up the end again. Sorry, apologies. I don't know about No, that. no worries. No worries. This can happen. Look, we're here for digital inclusion and <laughs> we need good connectivity. It excluded it's, me. It's crucial. <laughs> Um, well, um, we had uh, 24 votes uh, for the last uh, co-creation session. We were discussing uh, with Elisa and Anne-Marie about the, uh, the repetition of the history, really, because um, uh, earlier uh, in earlier years, people could not read. And we were discussing how can we teach everyone to read. And now we have digital education. Uh, and we discussed how the pandemic uh, uh, reinforced these obstacles and uh, the debates that were going on in uh, different countries. Uh, and now we pass the floor to Christina to wrap it up. Uh, maybe Christina, you want to repeat uh, what you were saying? Thank you very much. Thank you. So I was just saying a huge thank you to Vasiliki and Elisa who were like able to put so much information, uh, which I think is really hard to put so much information into this time frame um, um, and uh, giving us so many questions, um, input, uh, all naming all these challenges that are out there. And uh, we hope that uh, this was uh, relevant for all the participants um, and that they, this gave you kind of an overview, but also new things, new perspectives, new questions to think about.
I would also like to use the um, opportunity to thank Amiri for her amazing input and also for giving more information in the chat. I saw that also the exchange started there air which is great thanks so much for this uh, thanks also to me from the public in, um, consultation institute and uh, now we would like because uh, we have some minutes left um, to give the floor to you to uh, the audience if you would have a question to Anne marie to elisa or vasiliki um, or if you would like just to share a thought that you knew that you just learned today and that you think okay i didn't know that before but this is a really important point we should focus on if you have a question if you have a thought just raise your hand this is your floor we would like to give you the opportunity to um, speak up and to ask something if you'd like to we also have uh, two questions in the slido so uh, yes yeah, okay yeah, go ahead and start with that that's great the first one is can society ever accept that digital technology might never be all inclusive and that we should continue to maintain quality of line in person options yes i mean I think that I mentioned this also before, and I'd like to know also from Anne Marie's perspective, but definitely. So, in I work as the digital democracy expert uh, since many years now. And actually, every time I talk about digital democracy, I want to stress out that this is not a replacement for offline services and possibility. Actually, it is a complement to offline uh, possibilities. And I do think that online and offline should always go hand in hand. The reason being that, of course, we still have a big digital divide, but even if we were to close this digital divide also for vulnerable groups, I do think that the right to um, not want to be online should be kept. I do think that there are just some people, and we've seen it a lot also lately in more Scandinavian countries, I know for a fact that there are many people who just don't want to be online for their own personal reasons. And this is an, an important right to be kept. And I do think that, you know, offline services can just complement the, the online ones. Thank you, Lisanne. Marie, do you have something to add? Yeah, I think we will always need offline services as well and assisted digital ones. And in the UK, they actually calculate it. If you look at people with disability or without uh, the language or with literacy difficulties that there will always be about 10 to 15 percent of people who won't be able to use for example online public services but also studies have shown you know for people who are not digitally excluded trying to get an unusual query answered or deal with a tricky issue or something that needs an urgent response online they really need um, offline services then as well. So it's kind of for everybody. I mean, I'm not sure about the right to be offline. I wonder, will it become, you know, it would be like saying, I want the right to not use the written words. You know, you might have, a, have that right, but like as time goes on, there will just be, I think, fewer and fewer people who don't use online services. And I, I've also seen loads of really interesting suggestions from people who work with, for example, people with disability about how we can really make so many things accessible as well. Like we can do a lot better to make things more accessible as well. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, and the second question from the Q&A is, are these discussions on prohibiting personal data being used as a commodity? Are there discussions on prohibiting uh, personal data, I'm sorry, uh, being used as a commodity? Yes, definitely. I mean, at the EU level, of course, there are uh, many discussions around this. I mean, the, the only f the first step is, uh, of course, the, the GDPR, but the European Commission is definitely not stopping uh, here to be a front runner on how we protect uh, uh, citizens data and how it is not used as a as a commodity, especially when we talk about private companies using it for targeted marketing strategies, etc. So um, there are many things that are ongoing at the EU level, and um, yeah, I hope that we will have another discussion about this, uh, but uh, also, yeah, there are more technical issues to look at there, too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. I, I just know there's some discussions at EU level you probably know way more about than me, Elisa. Thanks. 
Thank you. Is both. there anyone from the audience who would like to ask a question or would like to comment on what was uh, presented? Just raise your hand or unmute yourself. Yes, I see Sophie. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. It was excellent. Um, just, yeah, just want to, uh, I see it. Uh, sorry, I should put my camera. Uh, I, I see it every day. Uh, obviously, I, I work with the Dublin City Council and it's getting very difficult uh, for people um, to access. As uh, you can see, the Dublin City Council is extremely reluctant to come back to uh, personal services. And here in the constituency office, uh, we have people coming because they, they can't access the services online. They can't access on their phone because they are new to their phone and they can read it as much on the phone. And then the offices are closed. And uh, especially after COVID, we can see it more and I can definitely see it as a push to stay uh, online uh, to save uh, money, I suppose. So, but thank you so much for today. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sophie, for this insight. Anyone else? Lorna, hi. Oh, you're on mute there. Sorry, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and uh, just to say thanks to everybody for the uh, presentations today and, and the contributions. I think it was fantastic. Um, I work with NCBI, the National Council for the Blind uh, in Ireland. And again, it's, uh, you know, every day we're, we're receiving uh, communications from uh, people up and down the country who have difficulty in all different ways. Um, so whether it's banking institutions and accessing, you know, financial supports, whether it's, um, you know, transport providers and, and trying to um, uh, get tickets for trains and, and those kind of pieces, all the way through to things like participation in cultural events and, you know, purchasing tickets for art shows and, and all of those kind of cultural um, performances and, and those kind of pieces. So it's right throughout society, I suppose. And uh, what we would continuously, and, and Sean, a colleague on the call as well, we would continuously try to, to push is that it, it's the platforms in accessibilities that are the barriers for people being able to participate and, and not um, a person's disability in and of itself, you know. So um, I think today has been really helpful in having some of those conversations and, and highlighting some of those specifics um, in where we can um, progress and, and where we can move forward, but really, really useful. And I know some people in the chat were talking about maybe trying to bring these conversations back into their own local groups and, and so on. And I think it's something we'd be very much interested in doing as well and um, through some of our, our advocacy networks and platforms too. So um, just to say thanks, and, and I'm sure a lot of us will be in touch as well um, after today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lorna. And I liked your point saying it's not about, it's never about the people, it's about like the accessibility and the platform to actually make it possible or not to participate. Would someone like to react to this? Yes, uh, thanks a lot uh, um, for this. I completely agree as well. Um, and uh, it was really helpful for me to work with, uh, I'm sure that you know, the umbrella organization, the European um, Disability Forum. And uh, just to mention that um, uh, that I found that the European Disability Forum during the conference on the future of Europe, there was basically a multilingual platform for citizens to actually contribute. So it wasn't only the representative samples in the citizens assembly, but there was a multilingual um, digital online platform where citizens could give contributions. And the European Disability Forum actually did an auditing of that online platform and came up with a report on how this uh, multilingual online platform should be improved for the next participatory democracy events, which I found really, really super interesting. And I actually think that all civic tech, um, you know, <laughs> developers should go through this uh, really good auditing report in which uh, it explains all the functions that should be implemented online in order to include more um, access and inclusiveness. Um, so yes, thanks a lot for also joining this session because I think that these conversations are not really talked about enough and uh, there's not enough reflection of how also how to move forward in digital transformation uh, in Europe. Okay, great. So is there anyone else who has a question from the audience? or a comment. Otherwise, just giving you some 
seconds to think about, but also like it has been a long session and maybe we will all be happy to wrap it up and, uh, and go to our, our lunch breaks. What I really, really would like to say thanks to Margaret and Darren for translating this. I know that this is a huge task and there were a lot of information, a lot of interaction. So thanks a lot for this excellent job that you were doing. Thanks a lot to all the participants who contributed, to all you out there to, who contributed um, to, to the Slido, um, answered all the questions and um, commented on it. As we said, Neve will uh, put them all in a report and we will send in follow-up email. Maybe we will need uh, some days for that. Um, but we will also put all presentations, all slides, the recording of this event for sure into this follow-up mail. So you will be provided with everything. Wow, so this was great. Thanks everyone. Thanks for all uh, who contributed, who have been here today. I mean, a very, very important topic that we actually probably we could talk about these five topics. We could have like, single sessions on each of those digital democracy, digital safeguarding. I think we could fill two hours easily. Um, yes, and also just letting you know, uh, we can also, yeah, we can also share this, uh, the, the links from the chat, of course, with everyone. Thanks again to everyone. I hope you have a beautiful day and um, see you next time. Oh, it's rich. Thanks a lot.